I will start right now. Um, so uh, this week is only half a week because um, on Thursday there's a holiday, so we won't have um, the day on Thursday, which is why this is just some uh, insertion of other stuff, named the debugger. So this is basically not um, concerning the topic of scientific program, but the uh, topic of programming in general. And I think that knowing the debugger is just so useful and using debuggers just makes your working process so much faster and so much more professional that I wanted to have it in there such that I can talk to you about, like if they can open stuff in the debugger if something doesn't work and we can look at it together and just so much more useful to look at stuff in the debugger which is why I'm showing you. Um, but first of all, um, those of you who worked already on the homework noticed probably there was a mistake in there. Um, and that was that it was impossible to solve it because I compared um, it to the original version. Like I had this data frame and we changed it and then I compared it to the original version, which always led to an error. Um, the error is fixed by now, and this is a general process of how we are going to fix errors. It's the first error in this year's homework, so this is actually rather uh, good. Um, and yeah, I told you already, like I made this notification on how to fix it, so I simply needed to change this test file, and for that I made a new GitHub commit with, on, like, on the distributor repository, homework 08, um, where I fixed this error. And then I run a script which fixes this also on all of your repositories. So what the script simply does is it looks at the last commit of this distributor repository, which is this one, which you don't see, and then looks which changes, which, which files changed from uh, the last commit to the one before, and then incorporates these changes onto all of your commits. That means now that if you cloned the repository, if you accepted the exercise, that means GitHub Classroom cloned the repository for you, and then you downloaded it, you cloned the repository locally to your, um, to your local machine, and then I changed the remote version of that. That means now you have um, differing files in the remote version and on your local machine, because I changed the version on GitHub, and to incorporate the changes on the remote machine, you first need to, if you changed already some of your data, you first need to commit your original data such that GitHub knows where this is, these are the files on your local machine, the way it is, I can restore them, these are the files on the remote machine on GitHub, in the GitHub server, this is how I can restore them. And then you can merge them. And actually this merge is rather easy because I only changed this test underscore whatever file and one of the data files and not your file. Um, this is a very easy merge for GitHub and uh, we can even tell GitHub use um, the test files used from the uh, remote from GitHub and the other files used from a local machine. And this is what we're doing. So I explained this in um, this announcement. So if you cloned the repository already, you simply need to um, commit all your changes you have so far. So commit your current work and then pull from the server. Like I said, I changed, oops, I changed um, the repository remotely um, such that you incorporate the changes. And then eventually if you did that, it looks like this. So these two commits are from me. I made them to the remote. Um, this is, um, for example, whoever this is last commit. So these are the local changes. And then once um, he or she pulled, this is, um, it made a merge commit. And then um, it worked on the local machine. And as soon as everything, uh, as you worked on the exercise, you can simply push that again. And it's also correct on GitHub. Um, so if there will be errors in the homework, this is how we distribute them. So in the future, if you try to push something to GitHub and it tells you map, there are changes on GitHub which you don't have, uh, don't be afraid, just simply pull them uh, or look if there's an announcement explaining uh, what's different there, pull the changes, merge them locally, which shouldn't lead to any problems ever, I hope, and then push it in you and then you get uh, the green tick. So yeah, sorry that it didn't work. Um, also, I noticed, so I provided the, I had this one clicker question, do you want to take part in the XM or not? I didn't realize that clicker only, can only stay open for a few hours, um, which is why it was closed for most of you. I now made it basically an evaluation. So we have this mid-semester evaluation now. It's week eight of 12, so it's not really mid-semester, but this is like um, simply a questionnaire of what we can do better and stuff and how happy you were with the uh, lecture. 
And then this here is another questionnaire which simply has one question. Do you want to participate in the exam, yes or no? Um, I would like you to answer like at least the exam one. This takes only five seconds, so please answer this one such that we know if we want to have an exam or if we want to have uh, oral examinations of that of you or if we don't uh, have anything. Um, and also the mid-semester evaluations we have. I will put the link into the next homework sheet as well, but just so you know on StudIP, if you look at the uh, front page of this class, you can see the evaluations right here. Okay, and then, yeah, like I said, um, this week, uh, or rather this Tuesday, I will only talk about debugging for a bit. Um, I did not upload this um, notebook because it didn't make too much sense for me because we're only working for a really short time in the JuPyter notebook. And then because I want to show you the visual debugger of PyCharm, I want to show you PyCharm at first, which is a really professional um, Python IDE. And I can obviously not show PyCharm in JuPyter Lab, so I'm gonna open PyCharm eventually. Okay, debugging. So what is debugging? What do we do debugging for? Well, debugging, uh, you do debugging if something doesn't work the way you want it or if you have exceptions. So exceptions, I took this from the basic programming Python class of last week um, up to a certain degree where I say, well, I really differ here. So this is just the first part of this is like, what are exceptions? So we see exceptions if I have stuff I shouldn't have, like I cannot have spaces and names or something that's a syntax error, I cannot access um, dictionaries at keys, I didn't put in there, that's a key error. Um, there's also the keyboard interrupt. So if I have an infinite loop and I want to um, stop it on the normal terminal, I would press Control C um, or on Mac Command C. In Jupyter Lab, I simply press the I key twice. That gives me a keyboard interrupt. And we see, for example, that a keyboard interrupt is simply a normal exception. So it, it uh, breaks as soon as I have, if I have it, raising this keyboard interrupt. So a keyboard interrupt is also a normal exception like everything else. Um, what is this here? So I want to enter a number. So I wait until I enter the number five. And what happens if I enter not a number but a letter? Well, I get a value error because I try to coerce this number here, which is a string, which is in this case a D, into a number. It doesn't work. I get an error. So there are many, many errors, of course. Um, many, many exceptions, of course. So these are some of them, but uh, these are only the ones which are there in the standard lib of Python. And as we uh, saw, pandas, for example, also has its own suite of errors, and NumPy also has, and there are just many, many errors, and um, it's not good to catch them all. So yeah, reading error messages, like I said, I took this from the basic programming Python class. I assume, well, we know how to work with this, so we see, well, it tells us what the error is, so this is a value error, so I can um, explicitly look for value errors. It even gives me more information, telling me that, well, I try um, to convert this letter D into an integer, and that's invalid. So D is an invalid literal for integers of base 10. Well, duh, so it provides me this information. And if I had that, for example, in not in Jupyter Lab, where it nicely shows me an arrow to the line I have the error, but um, if I have it somewhere else, for example, in normal file, it will also tell me the line and or even um, the uh, exact character, which is not always that exact, um, where it's missing, for example, here it tells me, well, in line one, especially in this, uh, in this part of line one, you have this syntax error missing parentheses. Okay, so how do we deal with errors? Well, we put simply a try except around this. I think I had this already in week two, so I'm just gonna go through it real quick. Um, so we see if the error occurs, and um, we catch this error. We say, well, in the case there, uh, a key error gets raised, please go into this part, and then this part is, for example, telling me where the key is not in the dictionary. Um, same for this loop. Like I said, I can catch keyboard interrupts, like I can catch every other error, and now, um, in this loop, I'm always in this infinite loop, um, but outside of this loop, I have my try accept block, and as soon as I have a keyboard interrupt, which gets raised in the line I was currently while um, I made the keyboard interrupt, while I pressed II or Control C, which is this line, um, and the next try accept block, which is able to handle this, is of course this one, and this then asks, well, uh, was the error I just got, the exception I just got, a keyboard interrupt? And if so, it does nothing. This is what the pass stands for. And then uh, the loop is already over. So this is also a nice way of letting the loop end. I can simply wait for a keyboard interrupt and then work with that. 
Um, I can also nest try accept blocks. So this is basically the same as here, except so that um, this is the same as here. So if I make a keyboard interrupt, it will still end it. So if I make a keyboard interrupt, it will still end it. Keyboard interrupt. So we see now this is not executed anymore. There's no star anymore. Um, but I can also nest it. So if I get an exception here, yeah, any kind of exception right here, this is where we're waiting because we're waiting here at the input. And then um, once we have a number, we're right here. So um, if the error I get is a value error, then I go into this block and say, well, a number, and then I'm, I handled that error. So I don't need to go out of this part, and I can simply restart my while loop in U. So this will tell me I want to have a number as long as I don't enter a number. And also, well, I stay here until I only break if the number is 5. So this also exit if the number is 5. Um, but I also catch this keyboard interrupt. So if I, if I exit this loop normally without an accept here, I go to this else block. So I have try accept else. Um, try is something that Python tries to execute. Accept is the block it gets into when this very exception occurs. And the else block is the part Python gets into when this exception does not occur. So if I do exit with a keyboard interrupt, I will not print this after, but that didn't work. And if I enter without the keyboard interrupt, um, I, I enter to this after. And yeah, try accept did not only have try accept else, but we also have the finally. And I already um, showed you this also in like the second week or something. Um, so if I'm working, for example, with files, I always want to have the final block. So the final block is always reached no matter if an exception occurs here or not. So if I try to open this file, um, opening files leaves this file handle open and I have to explicitly close it. Um, this can actually, even in Python, bring your laptop to crash. Like there, there are not many things that can make Python crash your laptop. But opening like 100,000 files without closing them is something that makes your laptop crash even, on, even in Python. So um, you always have to close file handles. And this is what we're doing here. So if this doesn't exist, um, we get an IO error. And we handle this here by, sell it, by, by telling us so. Um, but even then, finally, we want, even if it didn't work, we want to close the file handle here. So this is the way we would normally, and also in other program languages, do this. Um, Python even has, for this very example, Python even has a better way around that. Um, with the context managers, we had this already. So with open blah, 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 as and then a handle. And then as long as I'm in this intended, intended block, I am. I have this find handle existing, and as soon as I exit this block, so in the next line I would have here, um, Python would automatically call close on my file handle object. So context managers work much better there. I didn't actually catch. What did I? Okay. Um, could also, for example, simply catch the. Or rather, let me catch both of them. So IO error is something wrong, and file not found error is simply, eh, why doesn't this work now? Ah, oh, so why doesn't this work? Because this is obviously not my scope. Get this wrong here. Oh. So this was out of my scope, the error queued in this very line. So this is the correct way to do it. OK, so now I even catched. This also shows you how to catch more errors at once. OK. Um, as much for exceptions, we had this already. I'm just repeating this to give you a quick intro into errors. And then, like I said, I took this from the basic program in Python course. So what would we do to handle errors? Well, first of all, we read the error message and try to understand what it says. 
We try to locate the error. We try to fix it. We look at the error message. We go into the line where the error occurred, try to locate the error, see if we can fix it. That doesn't work. We search the internet. We search the documentation of whatever library we're working with. If that doesn't help, we try to find other people who have the same issue, Stack Overflow mostly, um, and then see if, we, like, see if we can isolate the program. We can even ask our own questions, Stack Overflow, blah, blah, blah. So we get new knowledge. We try to fix our code. So for most smaller mistakes, this should fix our problem. However, if there's something else, well, debugging gets more complex. So what do we do when we're debugging? So when debugging, important, always check your data. Do my variables hold the correct data type? Is something none where it shouldn't be? Is, it, is something a string instead of an integer? So if we print, for example, an integer, like I already explained to you a few weeks ago, Python will automatically make a string out of this integer. So when I print an integer, it looks like a string. However, maybe it wasn't a string, and I can't call the, uh, func like the methods I can call um, on a string or some integer. So it would also make sense, for example, to print the type of my variable such that I know, ah, I'm trying to deal with a string, but this is instead an integer. Next, do the values of the variables make sense? Um, did we even reach a certain position? For example, did we go into an if block? Did we even enter a loop? So how would we do that? What we normally would do would simply have a lot of prints. And this is what the debugging, uh, what, what the basic uh, program in Python course told you, that um, often a simple print is all you need. If we want to check if a variable holds the correct data type, we simply print the variable and the type of the variable. If we want to check if we went into um, an if block or into a loop, we simply make a print statement in that if block or in a loop and then see if it worked. This does make sense, and this helps you to check your program, but this is the basic way, and it's so, so, so much easier, in my opinion, um, to just open all this into in a visual debugger and then go through the program step by step, which is so much, like you have so much more overview than if you have a billion prints in your program and you have a really big program, you're eventually gonna have a billion prints, you don't know what to do anymore, you don't like, and if you want, if you finally found your bug, then you have to remove all your prints again, delete all your prints once you're done debugging, and this is really annoying, and I think just debugging with printing is okay when you're working on smaller things, it's also okay if you work on the homework for this class, etc. but in general, it's really much easier when you're working on bigger projects to use a debugger, which is what I want to show you now. Okay, um, but first of all, um, I want to uh, tell you the example I'm gonna show. Like, so this is um, where I, for example, also used the debugger a lot, was when uh, working with the homework correction thing. And how does this homework evaluation program work? Well, what I'm doing, in this homework evaluation program is, I'm looking at all the repositories in scientific programming US at this GitHub repository, which are these 1,500 something, and then I'm going into every single repository, look at what homework it is, so this says homework 08, the name is um, predictable because GitHub Classroom creates it for, for me, and then I look if, this, um, if the green tick is there. So this is what I'm doing, but I'm obviously not doing it in a browser because that's annoying, but I'm doing it using the GitHub API. What is an API, you ask? An API is a programming interface that, well, like your browser, like when you use your browser, you're accessing, you have an interface to the GitHub server, a visual interface. And just like your browser is a visual interface, an API is a programming interface. So it's like your browser just for code, for programming languages. And the nice thing about APIs is that they can be called with Python, with Java, with a terminal, with any programming language you like, and they return something you can work with. Um, mostly, for example, in this case, the GitHub um, version 3 API returns serialized dictionaries. So what does it look like? Like I said, also, I can also call the API from the terminal using this curl program. And what this curl program does is, well, I want to get something, so if I, want to get information from a web server, I use this get. If I want to post information to the get server, I would use post there. So this minus x get basically says which method of accessing the web server do I want to use. I want to use the get method. And then I have to provide a header. This is the minus h. And then this here is basically also a serialized dictionary. We see it's a key colon value. 
And this is my authorization of why I am allowed to go to that uh, server. This is a one key. I deleted um, this token such that you don't go on my GitHub because this token is important, right? Such that GitHub knows that I am actually like I am allowed to go to my repository. And then this is the um, this is the URL I want to access. So I can even open this URL in my web browser, and it will tell me, um, well, it will list me many, many repositories here. Actually, because I have the wrong authorization, it doesn't list me so many here. It only lists me a few public ones. Um, but if I had the correct um, authorization, so when I open it simply in my web browser, I don't have any authorization. So GitHub knows, ah, without authorization, you want to get the public ones. And here, with the curl, I provided a wrong author um, authorization, which is why um, the API will return me, you are unauthorized. So that gives me HTTP error 401, which says I'm unauthorized. Um, this minus I, by the way, um, makes this headers occur, because normally it return only this body. It will tell me bad credentials because I used the wrong authorization token. Okay, um, assume I just don't want to show you this. Assume I would have gotten all my repositories if I got, uh, if I used the correct authorization token. But yeah, um, just like we can call um, the GitHub API using this curl um, bash program, this curl terminal program, I can also do the same in Python using the requests library. And it works basically the same way. I import my requests library I provide my header here as a dictionary, simply authorization colon and then this token. And then I call request.get, so get the same way as we did on the terminal, provide the headers here and provide the URL. And then Python will return me something. And Python will return 401. Well, this is the same as this one. I just don't know what it looks like. So this is just, I wanted to give an example of where it's really useful to have the debugger because normally if you create your dictionaries and then you check if a key is in your dictionary, where well, you created the dictionary, you will see why a key is in there or why not. But if you get something from a source you don't know, like this is just something I get returned from GitHub. I don't know any about anything about its contents. And then it's really hard if you don't have a debugger or something to know what you can do with this. So this is something where this is a response for a one object, but I don't know what to do with this. So after a bit of Googling, I noticed that I can, for example, call this .json method on it. So I figured that out by Googling. And then I see, aha, this gives me this message body. That's nice. Um, but I want to have the headers because I want to have the information from here as well. How do I get this? Okay, and that's the question I'm going to ask, uh, I'm asking right now. and. As that's what I want to figure out eventually, and that's what I want to use the debugger for. Okay, um, now I first show you PyCharm because what I want to show you is the visual debugger of PyCharm because it's just a really nice debugger. So let me open PyCharm and explain you a bit of uh, the UI of PyCharm at first um, to make ourselves comfortable, comfortable with that before we then look at um, the debugger of PyCharm. So I opened a new PyCharm window and it's this. Okay, so I simply created file new project and then I created a new PyCharm project. So we see in the left column we have all of our files. Um, obviously these are none already. We see also PyCharm already created a virtual environment for us. I will get to that later. But first of all, let's simply make a new file. So I simply right click here, select new Python file. Yeah, by the way, um, PyCharm, I have the professional edition. You can get the professional edition as a student. You can get the um, community edition, even if you're not a student. And the community edition has basically all the features you need. I'm going to show one feature, which is exclusive to professional, um, but that doesn't matter. OK, so let's make a new file. Let's call this my requests. Um, so I made a new file here, and now in the big window, PyCharm opens the editor so that I can work on the file. And, well, let's put some content in there, print hi. How do I run this? Well, I can simply click on it here and run my requests. And this then will open this new window um, with the content. So 
what do we see here? So these are the files I showed you. This is while well, working on this one file. And this shows me the one dialog. Um, so this tells me what exactly it went. So it when the Python version, which is inside this very virtual environment, namely this one. So PyCharm, upon creating a new project, makes also a new environment, which makes sense. Because like I told you a few weeks ago, when you're working on bigger Python projects, you want to make sure that you have your own virtual environment for them. Because if you have conflicting, like if you, have, if you use libraries and they are conflicting with the libraries your system wants or something, you get problems when you replace them because then your system may not work properly. And because of that, for bigger projects, you always want to have your own environment for this project. For the homework, because the homework sheets are always just one sheet, it wouldn't make too much sense to create a new environment for all the homework sheets, which is why we made one environment for all the homework sheets. But generally, like I said, PyCharm is for bigger projects comprising multiple files. Then you would also want to have your own virtual environment. PyCharm knows that, which is why it creates your own virtual environment for you. And yeah, so this is what I would run if I execute this one here. And if I open this in a normal terminal, it works just the same way. So it uses this and this Python from the environment and then simply execute this file um, which I have here. Okay, what else do we see? Um, I can switch tabs here, so it also provides me a terminal. Um, this is a normal terminal. I can run all kinds of uh, terminal commands. Um, I can also run a normal terminal. Um, we see here that it some, has some weird combination of this virtual environment and this virtual environment. This is because PyCharm standardly uses virtual env. And we use Conda as virtual environments. We're going to change that in a second to make that not as bad. Um, but yeah, so it also has my environment activated. This one, this one. Um, what else do I have here in PyCharm? I also have the Python console, which is really nice. So this here is basically the same than if you're on a normal terminal, enter Python, and then open the Python interpreter like this. So that's just as I can in a normal Python interpreter, run normal Python commands, for example, one equals one. Um, I can do the same here, just with the nice added benefit, um, oops, the nice added benefit that if I have variables, um, I have them listed here as well. So I have all my variables, I can even delete them if I want, and I can just work with my variables. So it's a really nice way to see this. Okay. Um, so as this is the first time we're working with uh, files in general, let me um, show you one other thing. So imagine I had this file here. No, I did that in the virtual environment. Imagine I wanted to um, make some other file, and I wanted to import my requests. And here I print I'm another file. So what happens now if we run this one? It prints the hi and the I am another file. Why that? Well, because it imports the entire script part of this here, and this also prints then hi. This is not what we want to have. Um, what we do then instead is, just like in Java, uh, we create basically a main method, or rather because we not, don't have this object orient overhead, we create a main function. And then we ask if underscore underscore name equals underscore underscore main. And only then oops, uh, we execute the main. So if we open this program here again, it still prints high. But if we I mean, run this program again, it doesn't print this anymore. Because this underscore underscore name underscore underscore is a special variable, which simply Python gives the one you're actually executing. Um, Python gives the name main, and all others it doesn't. So if we have this here, um, we know that this one is not imported by the other stuff. OK. Um, blah, 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 blah. So yeah, um, PyCharm, really nice, has many features. For example, also have the Git. Uh, I even have Git integration here. So on my normal terminal, I could make a new Git repository. And what I see now, if I wait a bit, here, oh no, I'm actually, damn. Um, let me make a new Git repository here. Now if I wait long enough, it will even render this files bad, meaning that they're not added to Git. And I can, for example, also add them to Git here, blah, blah, blah. Like I said, for bigger projects, PyCharm is really useful. Okay, 
Um, yes. Good. So as much for that. Now, what happens if I want to import my pandas? Like I said, um, I made a new PyCharm, made a new virtual environment for me, and I cannot, I cannot import pandas because this virtual environment does not contain pandas. So what I have to do now is I have to change the environment PyCharm uses here. So if I look at my one configuration for this file, yeah, so this is, I can also run the program from here because this is like the current one configuration is this file. I can also run this other file from here, uh, uh, this file here. Um, but if I look at the configurations here, I see that the project interpreter, so this is the script path, so this is the script path in queues. These are command line arguments which I can even add, which I could interpret using ArcPath or something. And then this here is the interpreter. Oh, not again. Um, okay. Yeah, I think let's pause for five seconds or something again because again it crashed. I should tell somebody that it constantly crashes. I would tell you other stuff, but I can't because I, it's showing a program without having the program doesn't make much sense. Does it? Yay. All right. Um, yeah. It also tells me which interpreter it's using, and it tells me it uses the project default, which it finds in um, where this very virtual environment already showed you, and which is not the one we want to have. We want it to use uh, the one that has already our pandas, so let's make it use um, the scientific programming environment. How do we use, how do we do that? Uh, we open the settings, we go to our very project, which is untitled 2. Yeah, we see this is our project. We select which interpreter we want to have, and we can tell it here that, um, well, let's show all. And these are all um, Python virtual environments or Conda environments or standard environments I have on my system. And I can see where well, there is this scientific programming environment, so I can select this one. And now it uses this one as my standard um, Python interpreter. Normally, if it would work, which somehow it doesn't right now, um, it will list me all my installed libraries right here. And I can also install libraries from PyCharm. Um, so if I wanted to add, for example, I don't know, uh, SunPy. Oh, SunPy is not actually not listed there, but I don't know, progress bar, which is what I'm going to use in a second. You can even look at here, and it even provides me information, a description about it as soon as it loaded. Oh, yeah, there it is. So, yeah, I can even install stuff from inside PyCharm to my environment. Really, really useful. And if I want to edit, uh, so I could also add a new environment. I could add a new virtual environment. I could add a new Conda environment from my PyCharm on, even Docker and pipenv and using the normal system interpreter. Many ways of which environment I want to use. But yeah, I selected my um, scientific programming environment. And now if I look into my one configurations here again, I see that I still use the project default, but now the, the project default changed to my scientific programming environment. So now if I execute this, um, this piece of code, uh, I execute it using my new environment, which we see here, it changed because now it used the new Python. So again, Environments are simply telling me which Python am I actually using. 
And now it works, and importing pandas doesn't give me an error anymore. So yay, we are working in PyCharm. OK. Um, da -da 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 -da. I'm going to skip a bit here, but yeah. So let me um, get a bit further, because what's also oh, man. Um, what's also really nice about here, so let me actually skip this one. Um, don't look at this, but look at the Python console and opening um, right here. And because now I use, so this is another project. So we could look what um, Python interpreter we're using here, but we're using, uh, so we are using another interpreter here, but believe me, this interpreter also has pandas. So we import pandas as pd. So I simply opened a new instance of PyCharm, which I had on my other screen, because I have some files already in this project, as you see. OK, um, so I'm importing pandas here. And then I'm um, reading some data frame to just show you how nice PyCharm also shows you data frames. Well, this is a file not found error because I changed the path to data slash Pokemon, yeah. And what I see here is now that I have in my variables, I have this data frame. And this variable view of PyCharm always tells me all attributes um, um, this variable has. So I can call TMP dot, I can actually do that on my interactive kernel here, I can call TMP dot attack, which gives me um, well, this one column of that. Um, but what I can also do in my variable view is I can view this, because this is a pandas data frame, and PyCharm can work with pandas data frames and number errors and the like really nicely. I can view this as data frame, which, open this, which opens this sky view tab here, and which shows me the data frame in a really, really nice way. So this is, if you want to look at data frames, if you want to inspect stuff, it's so nice to do that in PyCharm because it shows you in a really nice way. OK, um, as much for the very basics of PyCharm, let's get back to our debugging problem. OK, um, I have this file here, which is, as we see, um, the very same thing as basically the part we had in Jupyter Lab before. And let me run this program. So, um, well, if I run this as a script, um, like I said uh, sometime um, in Jupyter, the last bit that a cell returns gets well, printed here as output. In uh, scripts, that's of course not the case. So I have to explicitly print it. And yeah, so what do I want to do here? Uh, I want to prove wrong that printing stuff is a nice way of debugging it. OK, so let's look at our JSON, which is what this returns. And let's look what it returns um, by printing it. OK, this is actually, this is what I wanted. So this is apparently the dictionary here. Um, and now it looks like it does in Jupyter. So if I, this here is the .json. If I want to get the JSON, I get this very dictionary. I get this very dictionary again. Good. So. Um, uh, but let's instead use the um, correct token. So this is the very same file, except that I don't want to show you my token, which is why I have this in another file and import it from here. So this is the correct token. And if we now, oops. and if we now run this, this is what gets printed. And this is why I'm telling you, OK, first of all, nothing. Gosh. OK, and this is why I'm telling you printing is not a nice way of debugging. So I'm printing whatever this returns me, and this is what it returns me. One very, 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 very long line. And if I wanted to get any information from this, it would be awful. Printing is an awful way of debugging. Like, what do I even do with this? I then open it in an editor, like copy the entire text, open editor, and then go through it using control F. That's all, all not a nice way. So let's rather use a debugger. This is what we're here for today, right? OK, so instead of running this program using this button, I debug the program using this button. Um, what happens now? Well, 
first of all, the same as running, because debugging is basically the same. Like If I debug a program, it basically looks the same as if I run it, except um, if I have breakpoints in it, which I don't right now. So what happens if I debug it? Um, well, it opens me this new tab, which is not run, but debug. And well, it gives me a bit of information. And first of all, so this is what it executes precisely. So it executes the debugger outside of it. So blah, blah, blah. Use this pydefd as the debugger. So it runs this debugger file. And then as argument, eventually it's going to have my file. But if I don't have any breakpoints in it, it looks just the very same than if I run the file. So debugging, like opening something in debugger, is not harder than running it if you have an IDE which provides this stuff for you or you simply learn this by heart of how to call a visual debugger or um, the normal Python debugger. Okay, um, but what is it useful for? Well, let's make actually, let's put a breakpoint in here. A breakpoint is a point where the execution of my program stops and gives me back like, uh, let's look at it actually. So I create a new, so I create um, a new variable and I give all the information I have here, this request.get, I simply make to a, a variable called JSON. And then I have a new, basically empty line where I only have the print and I set a breakpoint here. Breakpoint simply pressing left click um, to the left of the line. And what happens now when I debug it, it that will, is that Python will run to this very line um, the normal program and then give me back the power of what to do with my program now. So now, like I said, it's an interactive kernel and Python now, oh, screen again. this screen is really, really useless. Okay, um, meh. Okay, so I have to look at the back now, which makes it a bit harder because the screen just crashed again. Okay, what do we see here? We see all the variables which are currently active, um, which are currently which currently have a value. So we have the variable view here. We know this variable view already, kind of. We've seen this in the normal um, Python console, just that it's now the variables which exist in this very execution like interactively while this execution of the program is running. And we also have um, another page, um, another tab here with the frames. I'm gonna show you what the frames mean in a second. And we can also hit to a new tab, which is the terminal, which gives me the console, which is simply the output my program does. And because I don't have any print statements here, well, my program doesn't uh, return any output, so this is basically empty, uh, this is empty so far. But what's really nice is that I can now look in a nice way at this JSON. And I see, aha, my JSON is a list containing 30 items. And each of those 30 items is a dictionary, which has the key ID, the key note ID, the key name, and so on and so on. So we see that this is a list of many, many keys and values. And I can just look at it. And this provides me so much more information. Like it's, the, like, it provides me the same information, actually. Um, but it's, it, it's, uh, my overview is so much better than if I simply uh, printed that. Okay, so these are the variables I see here. Really useful. I'm going to show why it's useful um, quite a few times in the next uh, 45 minutes. Um, but let's also look at these frames here. So what are frames? Um, frames are basically like um, scopes of execution I'm currently in. So, like I said, my, if I run it in a debugger, my program is not run itself, but the, progr like the program which is actually run is the debugger, which then has some stuff which then calls inside the debugger my program. Okay, and these frames, all the time I enter a new function, I go one step, I go one, I have, uh, I go one frame, I, have, I enter a new frame, okay? And the frames which are not used, uh, which are not part of my code, but of other code, uh, PyCharm shows me in um, yellow, which is why these are all yellow. And if we look at this, um, we look at the top one, this one is not yellow um, because this is my code. And then inside these frames, Py PyCharm will also tell me which variables are there inside this very scope and 
which are not. Because so if I change now uh, to another frame, like I said, so PyCharm also renders this in yellow, as we see. So I know this is not part of my program, but something else. And I see that here in this frame are variables which are not there here anymore. And this is a bad way to show it to you. Let me find a better way of showing it. And let me. Okay, um, let me make, let me put all this stuff into a main method again to show you what I mean. So I make def main, I have this, oops, I have all this stuff here. Don't forget the breakpoint. And then um, I add this here. So PyCharm is professional, so it has nice ways of saving your keystrokes. And this is just some way of saving me keystrokes um, to add this stuff because it's so common to edit. And if we now um, go into the debugger again and look at the frames, what we see here is that there are now two frames which are not yellow, which is this and then this. So the first thing that the debugger saw when it, uh, when it well, interpreted the file line by line, so it imported this, it imported this, it created this function without entering it. And then it checked if this if conditional true, and then it entered this very line. So this is the line um, we were at before. This line then opens this main func this uh, my main function, and this is then the next frame. As soon as I enter a new function, I enter a new frame, and we see here. So this is where we are in line 12 right, right now, and there are no variables here besides special variables, which are the imported requests and the username. P PW. Oh, I don't show that because I don't show my username and password. Um, but yeah, so these variables are not here. And if I'm in this frame, so this is where I basically exited the frame of my script part, my module. And now I'm in this main function here, which um, it will tell me. Like I'm in the main function of this and this file, especially I'm in line 8. And now in this frame, there are variables which weren't there in the outer frame because I created this auth header and the JSON, I created inside this function. So they're only there in the scope of this function. They're not there in this scope, okay? And that's a really nice thing that I can look at all of this. I actually just show you my token now. So the debugger also shows you all the variables right next to where I created them. So it does show you my token. So I will need to revoke my token um, right after the lecture. OK, let's not return the JSON, but return um, instead um, the entire response. So this is the entire response. Why do we have this? So if we look at um, so where we left off is that we wanted to find the headers here, right? So we can get the JSON, but when we use the curl library, uh, the curl program, we saw all these headers here, which we don't have here in Python, and we want to check if we can get them in Python too. So what we're doing now is we look at the entire response, and then after creating it, let me print again such that I have this breakpoint here, and then I see that I now have this response object, and when I look at it, I see all um, where the attributes it has. And if I look sharply, I see that it has, I said if I look sharply, I see that it has a headers attribute. And in this headers attribute, it has, so this headers attribute is a case insensitive dict. So again, this is so much better we see than printing because if we printed it, we would well, print the content, but we wouldn't know what type it was. And like I said, an integer looks, if we print it, this very same way as a string looks. So it's nice to also know if it's actually an integer or a string. And if we look into the headers here, we see that there's an underscore store. And there are, this is actually the stuff I wanted. I wanted to have this x weight limit, x weight limit remaining, blah, blah, blah. So this is the same thing as my curl library returned me here. So this is what I wanted to get at. Really nice. Um, so this is where we're at. Now. The next thing I'm going to show you is this evaluate expression, and this is what makes the debugger so powerful. 
because at this, like at this very, um, well, at this frame, at this very position, position of my source code, I can play around with the variables that exist here. So for example, I can look at my response object, my rest object, and it will show me uh, my response object in this very window. I can look, so I, uh, I said this headers is an attribute of this response. So let's see if I can call response and then uh, index it at headers. I see, hmm, this is a type error, it's not subscriptable. Ah, okay, so it's not subscripting, but I have to call resp.headers. Does this work now? Yes, it does. And it returns me this case insensitive dict. Now I want to get this underscore store from this. So I, again, I could at first assume that this is some kind of a dictionary, and I look at it. Nope, nope, it's not. But instead, the store is again an attribute. So let's call underscore store. And we see, ta-da, there I have my order dict. And if I wanted to get, for example, the x weight limit, um, I can uh, do so by calling here x weight limit limit, and I get this value. Okay, I don't get the precise value. I wanted to get the number, which is at the first index, as I see here, and I can index it at one. And if I execute this now, if I evaluate this now, it returns me 500. Good, nice, um, that's the string so far. Let's make an integer out of this. Um, whoops. Let's make an integer out of this, and ta-da, everything works. So we can do this live, and I don't need to restart my program all over and over again because this request here, this is a call um, to the GitHub API, which takes some time because it has to send a lot of data to GitHub and then even more data from GitHub back to me. And if I always wanted to, if I didn't know how this looked like, yeah, I had needed to execute this program so often, having so many prints in there, but having the debugger and simply being able to stop my program right at this position and then play around with what variables are there and what sub-variables they have, it's so much faster. And it's so much more useful. And this is basically the important thing I want to show you. OK, um, so what did I actually show right now? A short detour back to this request. So like I said, um, this is a problem I was actually having when uh, calling the API. Because, so how do APIs work? Um, when I'm when I call an API, I ask the server, hey, could you please provide me this data? If I do this in a browser, I normally do it once, and then I scroll on this website for a few seconds, and eventually I'm going to open a new website, blah, 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 but I only make a, a request uh, to the server once every few seconds. If I use an API and a script, I could say while true, and then um, um, request something from the server. And because the server always needs to, like, we have uh, authorization, so the server needs to ask me, are you really who you tell you are? And then I say yes, and then the server, okay. In that case, I give it this and this, this, and this stuff, um, this and this uh, response. So this all takes um, computing power from the server, and because the computing power of a server is limited, it tells me, and because it wants to prevent, for example, DDoS attacks, where the server is uh, overloaded by making too many uh, requests on it, it gives me this X rate limit which is really, really annoying. So this limit limits how many requests I can do per hour. And uh, as soon as I reach this, so it tells me my limit here is 60 um, because I have a wrong token. If I had the right token, my limit would be 5,000, um, as we see here in PyCharm, because in PyCharm I do have the right token, right? So I have the right token here, and my limit, as we see here, is 5,000. Um, no. There it was. And it will tell me how many, so how many I originally have, how many I have remaining. So for every new call I make, it's going to decrease this number by one. So now it should be 59 because it just reset it. Because it resets every hour, now it's 58. Uh, if I execute it again, I said, now it's 58, and so on, so on. And then it will also tell me um, when it resets. So this is the Unix time. We worked with Unix time last week. Yay, we can do this. OK. so. My huge problem was that for some reason, I always reached this limit. I had a limit of 5,000 request calls, and I only made like two, but it told me, map, you're full, and you made enough requests. So I was devastated and didn't know what to do. So 
I opened, um, so I did this, of course, in the debugger. I always do stuff in the debugger because I always code using the debugger. So imagine I wanted to just extract what my limit is and print it. Like I said, if I did it the normal way, it would take ages. But if I have it, um, if I have the debugger, I can simply, well, now I can copy all the stuff here and, um, well, and then add a new variable limit equals and then this. And ta-da, I'm done. And as soon as I execute it again, so note that I cannot add stuff to the file while it's being executed. I can in certain conditions, but it's not. Um, so I, I know it works in Eclipse in Java, but um, it doesn't work here in PyCharm and Python. So let's just not do it. It also leads to many side effects, which we don't have, because it doesn't, like if it changes the number of the amount of lines, it changes many things and stuff. But yeah, so just if we add something to our actual code, like we did here, um, we need to execute our uh, entire program, so we need to debug it again. And now, once we, de we uh, debugged it again, if we look, if we evaluate again, and we look at the limit, we see, well, we have the limit variable here. And now the limit variable is actually known inside this program. So this is something really nice. Okay. Um, but yeah, so I still had the program, uh, the program, the problem that I, for some reason, that this um, limit went down and down. And because of that, I wanted to count, for example, myself of how many requests that something calls are actually made to GitHub. And to count that, I made a wrapper around this request. And this, this wrapper basically behaves the same way as my request objects and provides the same interface and internally calls the original request, but just gives me a wrapper around that, that, for example, counts the number of calls. Okay, so in this file, I import the request library and under a new, oops. Um, in this, I open the request library under a new name. Where are we? I um, import the request library under a new name, and I make, a new, I make this wrapper. And the get method of this wrapper simply calls the get method of what I import, and then has two additional functions to check this expert limit stuff. But I can, I can use it the very same way as I, I would use the normal request. This is simply a normal wrapper. And then in the end, I say request equals request wrapper. And now if I import not um, requests itself, but if I import it from this wrapper, um, I, every time I use requests, I go into this one. Yeah? Make sense? Makes sense. Okay, uh, where were we? I think we were here. Okay, so instead of importing requests, this is really annoying that I don't have the screen. Uh, instead of importing requests, I from request wrapper, and then I import requests from here. What happens now if I debug it again? Well, um, I see now that. No. Ah, it takes some time. <clears throat> like I said, calling GitHub is. Ah, okay. I don't have any internet at all right now. Ah, this is shitty. I wanted to show you a bit of stuff. Ah, okay. Now it works. And what I see now, well, I made a breakpoint in here. So what, what happened now? I now entered some obscure part of my program. Can I? restore what obscure part of a program I opened. Yes, I can, because I got the frames, right? So, so let's start at the lowest frame, which is not yellow. And I see, well, I executed, I was in my module, I was in line 13, and I was right here. Ah, okay, that makes sense. That's the call of the main function. And then that opened my main function. And the next, so this is the next frame. I was in my main function, and I was in line 7 here. And then in line 7, I opened, I called another method of mine because now I imported from my own project and PyCharm knows that I want to look into that, into my own code as well. So now it opened a new frame, which is this very get. So um, the main function at this very line opened the get method of, um, of my request wrapper object. Can even make that more visual. So if I look at my variables here, I know I have the requests in here, yeah, because um, it's one of the special variables I imported here. Now, 
it tells me that my request object is a request, like it's an instance of type request wrapper. And if I, I can even jump to the type source and I can even look here, aha, PyCharm is really useful. It tells me this is where you are. OK, but let's get back to the frame um, because inside the frame there are the variables we want to have. And we see now that I'm in this get here. And in this frame, we see that, for example, the self variable exists. So if I call self, um, there is something. And this self, well, is a reference to this instance of type request wrapper. OK, this does not exist outside of this frame because right here in the frame of that function that called it, um, there is no such thing um, as a self object because, well, it's not in this, like self is not in this scope, but only in this scope. Okay? And then um, I'm actually in this very line because, why am I in this line? Because I called the self.ing function here and the self.ing function method, I mean, um, is this one and I had a breakpoint right here at the ink. So what happens here, where I opened my wrapper, so I, I, I called the get method of my wrapper, and then inside the get method of my wrapper, I called the increase method of my wrapper, and inside this increase method, I, have another, I had another breakpoint. Why did I have this breakpoint? Well, because I wanted to have some breakpoint, like I wanted to get notified of uh, every 50 calls. So as soon as I made 50 calls, starting at the first one, um, I want to get into this breakpoint. Okay, um, so that's one thing. Um, bah, bah, bah. So let's remove it. I just wanted to show you uh, of where, how to look where in your code you are. Um, but let's um, not have this breakpoint here at the print, but let's make another breakpoint here where we actually get it, where we call the get. So how do we go through our program step by step? And this is the next really nice thing about the debugger. So I can set my breakpoint here that, such that it will stop at this very line. And from then on, I can go through my program step by step using this console, um, these buttons here. So this goes steps over. So this will execute whatever, here is exec whatever it can execute here um, and won't go into there except if there's a breakpoint. And we'll go to the very next line. So if I press this button here, I will go to the next line after um, it executed whatever it could execute right there. OK? Um, instead of stepping over this, there are also the buttons step into and step into my code. So step into looks if there's any functional method called here. And if so, it will open this functional method. So if I step into this, I step into this get method because this is the next frame. I'm stepping into the next frame. OK, if I now step into this again, I step into this uh, imported requests. Um, but again, I see this here is yellow, and this is not a file I made. And if I'm debugging and I'm looking for errors, I'm not looking in other libraries. The error might be in other libraries, but the chance is 0.001%. So 99.999% of times, the error is you, and the error is in your code. So let's step out of this again. There's, just like there's a step into, there's a step out button here. So now we're stepping out, and we're again in the frame above that. So we, we stacked one frame above, and now we're at the frame um, below. So um, what you probably, if you had info A already, what you, for example, had was a stack overflow if you had a recursive function without, um, without the recursions anchor. Um, what happened then? Well, your function opened your function, opened your function, opened your function, opened your function, and this frames here. Like Python has to keep the overview of which frames you're in because once you exit out of some function, well, you go into the outside function. So this was the stack. This is the stack that overflows if you have a stack overflow error. Okay, but yeah, um, this let's not step into this because it's imported. And a really nice feature is. I think this is actually even exclusive to PyCharm. Exclusive to PyCharm. Step into my code. So this steps only into your functions or methods if you wrote them yourself. And if we do this, well, it knows that I imported this function, that, uh, that this is something I didn't write. It's not part of my project. And I don't step into it, but instead I step over. But if I press this button here, because I made the check x rate limit function myself, um, I step into this function. OK? So imagine, aha, I want to keep this status here, so let's make a breakpoint here. 
And the next time I debug my program, I'm right here at my breakpoint. Actually, I'm not right here at my breakpoint, but I'm at the breakpoint before. I can set as many breakpoints as I want. Um, but speaking of control flow, I can also resume my program, which will continue until it hits the next breakpoint, which is eventually here, this one. OK, so I can let me remove the old one because I don't want to look into this, but I only want to look in this. And now, OK, here again, um, I could play around with this because, well, I have this response here, and I want to get the headers out of it. So after playing around with it for quite some time, I eventually figured out that, aha, I can, uh, so if I make a dict dictionary comprehension like this, so this is how I wanted to have the headers. Like now it's a nice Python dictionary. This is the way I want to have it. What I can also do in the debugger now is I can even set new variables, right? I set this variable's headers here. And once I execute it, it exists here. However, um, keep in mind that it only exists in this very one of the programs. So as soon as I stop and re-execute it, uh, so print headers. So there used to be a headers here. So as soon as I stop and re-execute it, Python will tell me, man, I don't know what headers is. Um, oh, the internet here is really, really slow. <coughs> so probably we have the error that it uh, couldn't connect to GitHub. Um, but I yeah. ah, no, it got so fast. So headers is not defined here. So um, only if I, like, if I have this in this one, one of the program, um, I don't have it in all of the ones. So in this session, they are there. Normally, they are not. Blah, 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 blah. OK, now imagine I did all this stuff, and eventually um, I got to this. So again, there are some caveats here, because for example, like I said, the, oops, the um, so even if I got these headers here, yeah, and then I wanted to know when it makes the reset. Um, well, that is the headers x weight limit reset. So I evaluate headers at the index x limit, at the x, I mean, uh, x limit reset. And now it gives me the time of the reset. And now again, if I did that only with prints, it would take forever. But if I'm working in the debugger and I'm working in this evaluate window, I can eventually figure out. I can eventually figure out that this year would have been. So we had this last week, so I'm not going to explain it. Um, uh, but we see that this year is the correct way of transforming this timestamp in uh, this. The way GitHub represents the daytime here to a normal timestamp. So we see here again. I cheated a bit with the time zone, but never mind that. Um, yeah. So this year is a nice way of showing it. So. Eventually, I could make this new function. And I can even add this function here. Once I have this function here, I can simply evaluate it once. And now it's here. For now, it's part of like, this variable exists. I think it's a special variable. Yeah, it's a function here. It's a special variable. And now if I call time from headers with headers as argument, it will return me this very thing. Because I executed it inside my window. OK. And then, um, so imagine I did all this stuff when I wanted to print where once the limit is reached, I wanted to print that and then exit. Um, or if the limit is uh, close to getting reached, I want to sleep until um, my, I get the reset. The reset time is reached, blah, blah, blah. Well, it's also really nice, for example, what I always do that I when I have some exceptions that occur only once in the blue moon, and I just don't get when they occur, um, so I can just put a try accept around it, have a print here, and then make a breakpoint like this at this print. I can even print the um, trace back here um, so that it always prints in the trace back so that I have something to work with, um, but that I didn't leave the program. Uh, yes, there's also post mortem debugging, so the possibility to, be, to, to debug if an actual ex exception occurred. Um, but this is for all exceptions of a certain type. And if I, to have, if I only wanted to uh, break at this very exception, this one, for this part of the code, um, then I would do it like this. OK. So yeah, debugging in projects. Really nice, really useful, blah, blah, blah. 
Okay. I'm almost done. Okay, so let's look at one other real quick example. Um, so yeah, imagine we ran this code. Well, this is some, something really simple if the uh, one before was too, too complex for you. So what does this do? Where well, we simply have this test value list, which is a list from 10 until 1. And we see already by sharply looking at it that there's an error. And there's a 55 where we would assume there's a 5. And then if we run through it, we see, um, well, what, what does this program do? Well, it tests if the index of a cell is equal to the value of its cell. But if we run through it, it doesn't print so. So let's um, look and let's look into it uh, with the debugger. And we see where well, this is now a loop. So first time of this loop, i equals 0. And test value is still this list. So as soon as I continue my program, I go into this loop again and into this breakpoint again. Now i is 1. And now i is 2. Now i is 3. i is 4. i is 5. And here I would assume it prints me something, but it doesn't. So let's evaluate it. Let's look at i and at <coughs> test value at the position i. And what do we see? Well, while i is 5, test value at the position i is 55. So I know, aha, I need to change this. Um, yeah, we don't need this, doesn't make sense. That's the other example. But yeah. So now if I execute this again, or if I rather if I debug it again, um, I can again go through, go through, go through. Isn't this annoying that I, in this loop, that I always ex enter this breakpoint in this loop? You're right, it is really annoying. So what can I do about this? I can right click this breakpoint and set a condition on which this breakpoint only occurs. And I want the condition to be, well, I only want to reach this breakpoint if i equals 5. And now if I continue my program here, i is 3 right now, it will skip the 4. Actually, it would have skipped all the other ones until i is 5. And now um, I can evaluate expression again. And I can check, ah, now they are the same. They are of the same type, and they are of the same value. So now if I go into the next line, aha, I reach the next line. So let's continue our program. And what does? Well, it crashes because we can only concatenate strings and strings. And this here, i is an integer right now. So what do we do now? Well, like I said, there's post-mortem debugging. And um, PyCharm can um, simply, on all exceptions, open me the debug window such that before, like, it, in, imagine, like, if I had a try accept around this, and I would be in the accept block. Um, it did have the exception already, but you're allowed to do other stuff. What do I mean by that? Well, let's open. Um, this is the list of all breakpoints. So all the time I click somewhere here, I add this to the list of all breakpoints, which I open via hitting Control Shift F8. And I can simply tell, well, make me an exception breakpoint at any exception. So now what it does, it, as soon as it notices an exception, where well, it's just removed its breakpoint because this works now, as soon as it finds an exception, it makes this exception breakpoint here. It even prints the exception on the terminal, but I can still, forego, uh, can still go for post-mortem debugging. And I can still, well, let's look at this code. So let's evaluate this, and we see, mm, yeah, you're right. This is a type error, but what if I convert but what if I convert this into a string? Ah, now it works. And it does even print. So even if I'm in this evaluate window, prints are still sent to the normal, uh, to the normal console. So now, yeah, this um, seems to work. So let's replace this by this and execute all of this again. So we don't have any breakpoints then, but in there, but uh, we still have the postmortem debugging activated. But it's not necessary. Program runs through, finishes normally. And it did find the value 5. So this is how we're debugging using the debugger, again, in a simple example. OK, I have one more example to show one new, one other feature of the debugger. And then I want to show that with the penultimate homework and then with the ultimate homework. It's going to be quick, but we're going to manage. Um, let's, oops, let's not search for a file. Let's make 
a new file, new Python file. What do I even want to do with this? Debug. Um, no, I don't want to edit to Git. And now, okay, what do we do? So um, I actually cached my GitHub requests here. So this here is the same thing um, as if I loaded it from the Git from GitHub, but because the internet is so unstable, I'm happy that I made this cache here. Um, so now this loads the cache file into, and if we're looking at it, so we just make a new break breakpoint. Oh, we're not executing this one. So we say here, debug this one. Um, and if we're now looking at what I have here, so my I see my content is all of the, um, a list of all of the GitHub repositories here. Okay, um, so what I want to, for example, do is I want to extract all the homeworks, like for example, say all the six homework. And I see all the repositories here have a name, and I can extract, for example, all the ones um, where this name starts with 2019 homework 06. And I can do so by, for example, executing this list comprehension, so this gives me all the repositories whose name start with homework 06. So this works nicely. Okay, if I wanted to do that not only with homework 06, but with more of, but with more homework, I would have an expression which would be quite a few lines because I would need another um, comprehension or rather I would rather do that in a normal for loop because comprehensions get really messy if you nest them. So let's do that in a normal um, Python interpreter. And what's also really nice is that I can switch to the console tab here and then um, show the Python prompt. And now it opened me an interactive Python kernel. So now I can, for example, look at variables. So content at the position zero is this element. And here I can execute all Python code I can imagine. And it's just there and I can simply copy it afterwards. So imagine I want to list all my homework here, so all homework that we had so far. So this would be a simple list comprehension. So let's look at my HW's variables. So this is homework one until homework or one until homework or seven. So this looks nice. And then, like I said, um, imagine I had this more complex bit of code. Um, actually, it's not that complex, but it's a nested loop. And in this nested loop, I wanted to do the very same thing here not only for homework or six, but for all the homework. So I can simply paste that piece of code here, click enter. Some um, so the way names are given in this window and in the evaluate window is a bit different than the original terminal, which sometimes leads to side effects. Um, but if I execute it again, so it didn't know that homeworks, homework existed here so far because it couldn't define the first time. That's an error of PyCharm, but if you execute it twice, it works just fine. So let's execute it twice. Haha, now it works. And if I now look at homework repos, or rather let's look at this in the value window because it shows it me so nicely. If we now look at, I said, homework repos, I see that it works perfectly fine and lists me all homework 01 until 07. Okay. Yeah. So. Uh, as much for that. Now I want to show you for one second on the penultimate homework uh, how to debug pandas. So for this, um, so somebody debug pandas. So this is um, the Pokemon task from the penultimate homework, and somebody told me, um, rightfully, uh, that. Somebody told me that um, I should have merged, for example, normal flying and flying normally. So I loaded the um, Pokemon CSV, made a data frame out of it, and then looked at the most common type combination. But normal flying and flying normal is actually the very same type combination. And I forgot that. So I added it this morning. and. How is the process of doing such a thing? So if you have your homework, um, so what I did, this, this is just as a demonstration. So I had this function here, and this is what the um, test script reads in. 
not important for you right now. I just copied it from the test script. OK, and what I do now here is where I set a breakpoint at this very function because I want to get here. Now if I debug this, I'm, well, Oh yeah, Pokemon at CSV. Yeah, I removed the file. Was Morton debugging? But yeah, um, now that it does find the file, yeah, I'm in the correct frame. I'm right here, and I step into my code, and I am. Let me step forward here. And now I have this type nums. And if I look at type nums here, oh, oops. And if I look at type nums here, and tada, there's again this view as data frame that's so nice. We can debug pandas so nice because this doesn't look nice. But here in my um, sky viewer, it looks really nice. And what do I see here? Um, well, I see, in fact, that, give me an example, uh, flying, dragging, flying, dragon, and dragon flying. It's a dragon flying. So we have dragon dragon flying here, and we have flying dragon here. And the count of them should be summed. And now I'm thinking, well, how would we do that? Who? OK, so I have my type, type nums here. And how would I go through debugging it now? Well, I want to work with the indices works. I want to work with these two columns because in the end I want to, for example, combine these two columns. So let's, for example, go for an apply. Um, and in this apply I can make a stupid, for example, print function here because I only want to show what, what am I actually looking at. So, And if I execute this bit here um, and look at the console, which is in this top here, I see Ah, OK, so now it returns me the entire column. Now, I don't want to work with column. I want to work with rows. So x is equal to 1, I think, and I'm working with the rows. Executing this again, and I see, yeah, now I get the row. So this is what I'm getting um, all the time. So if I don't print it, but uh, simply return it, probably looks better because I see it returns me a series. Oh, it actually returns me a data frame. What? I thought it would be a series. Ah, yeah, klar. It, it returns me the entire data frame because it gives me, well, line by line, row by row of my data frame, right? So, but what I can do is I can instead, for example, well, give me type 1. Um, uh, plus a space, plus, and then the column at type 2. Uh, So what does this look like? So let's execute it again. View a series, and we see, ah, nice. Now it returns me series with well, the two columns together. Um, it doesn't make much sense like this, but you can imagine how it makes sense if you, for example, sorted these two columns alphabetically. Um, so I have this code already copied to be faster. So this is simply. Give me first row, then second row, if the first row is alphabetically before the second row, and otherwise give me second row, then first row. This simply sorts, sorts these, uh, not, not row, but column, this sorts these two columns alphabetically. And if I execute this and view it, we see that here we have, this is all alphabetic order. And yeah, so we see that now this is correct. So what can we do? Well, we can make a new column for this, so type nums at the new column type is equal to this. And now, well, let's try just putting this code into here. So are we done already? We're wondering. Um, so let's do it. Let's restart our program. And let's see what happens. And we see, yeah, well, I got so far. This is nice. And if I now continue, um, well, it was actually a stupid thing to do because well, I'm still going for type 1, type 2 here. So let's not go for type 1, type 2 here, but 
Yeah, well, in fact, so now I have them in the correct order, but I still have two columns for type 1 and type 2. And in fact, I should have done that earlier. Blah, blah, blah. Let me try that as first line. So this here does basically the same thing as here. Um, wait, I said. So this thing, um, as we see, does the same thing here. So it gives me, so it simply makes the new column, it puts the new column to the original data frame. And now I can, for example, I don't want to sort on type 1 and type 2, but simply on my type here. And if I did that now, and I went into it with the debugger, yeah, yeah, I don't want to look at it here, I see, hmm, this gives me an exception, and I have the postmortem debugger, and that tells me smaller is not supported between instrument of string and float. And I'm like, string and float? Why is there a float in there? And I look at, um, all Pokemon at the column type 2, 2 I mean, 2, and I see that they are NANs. So I saw in the debugger, and again, this would be lines and lines and prints and prints if I wouldn't do this in the debugger. And so instead, I know simply if there is no second type, I simply make it NAN because the task description said that we only consider double types which was not necessarily um, the smartest task description, um, but it's just how the task description was. So now, if I don't have a type 2, I return nothing, and otherwise I return them in the order I want to have. And now let's execute all this again after we apply this new fix. And what do we see now? Yep, again, post-mortem debugger, somewhere in this indexing thingy, but this is all yellow, we don't look at it. The actual error occurred, so my error occurred in this line. So what happens if I uh, try to execute this line? So let me just do that. Um, here we go. And we see type is not in the index. And then, hmm, OK. So type underscore nums. And I see that, well, if I look at the columns, there is no type column. There's a type 1 and a type 2 column. And this is because I shouldn't group by type 1 and type 2 here, but instead I now group by the entire type. So let's do this. So I figured that out after a lot of thinking, blah, blah. You know the drill. And now, mm -hmm, still a key error. Um, actually, oh yeah, sure. I should add the type here, actually, because I'm not doing anything. All Pokemon at the column type equals. So this didn't return anything so far. Um, so let's look at it again. I still have an error here. Oops, still have an error here. Not enough values to unpack as my new error. And I'm like, mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what do I see here? Um, well, I want to make. Um, so this here returns a list with one element. But I want to unpack two elements from here. So let me split this entire thing. Um, dot split at the dot such that I don't return one, but uh, uh, I mean, I can just simply take the zeroth element and then just split right here, for example. Da, da, da. Now it works the correct way. So we simply copy this and add this here. And we do this. And I think now there should be one last error, because in the end, the assertions don't match. Why don't the assertions match? Well, if we look at our result, we see that our egg one here um, has type 1, type 2, and type column. Ah, this type column is new. I should have deleted this. Um, instead, I can, for example, also make a backup here. So I'll Pokemon backup equals all Pokemon.copy. And then I simply use the backup here. So this is just skimming over a lot of thinking. 
right? But I'm just telling you in the debugger, it's so much faster and easier, and ta-da, we done, no exception anymore. So this is how we fix it. Okay, um, not really much time to look at the last homework, but I want to show you just real quick of how nice it would look if you opened it in an explorer. So let's file, open, um, and then homework, homework of seven sample solution. Uh, let's make a new Python window for that. And if we open this now, what's really nice, are you opening it? Did you open it? Homework of seven, there you go. Um, so first of all, so imagine I just opened it for the first time, so this is all empty. So first thing to note, it renders me the markdown file really nicely, and I can also say, haha, split it here, so it's like that I see the task description all the time, yeah, right here. And then what I can do is I can, instead I want the task description split. Good. And then what I can do, I can, for example, simply go into my test file. So I did this already, so imagine I did not do this. This here is my test file. And all the time, my test file um, calls some function or method from my module. I simply make a breakpoint right there. And then, such that I can open my module at this position. And then when I uh, click this for the first time, PyCharm is really smart, and PyCharm will notice that this here is a PyTest file. All, method, all functions are starting with test underscore, such that PyCharm will know that it has to run PyTest in here, which is really smart of PyCharm. Not so smart that I don't know how to execute this file without PyTest, but whatever. And I can also debug the PyTest. Debugging simply means stop at the breakpoints. And if I do that, well, first of all, okay, let me, let me actually show you the one PyTest at first, because this is really nice, because you can simply run PyTest, and um, it will notice that this is not a normal one dialog, but a PyTest dialog, and it will render it nicely. It will tell me three or three tests pass, that was the time, and this is the entire output, output it gives to me. So PyCharm natively handles um, PyTest, but what's also really nice, it also is able to debug PyTest. Okay, so here, like I said, I made a breakpoint every time I call my module, what I can do now is, what I can step into my code of my program here, and I can look into what my functions are doing. So in the first task, so we were supposed to fill in missing values. First of all, we sorted. So what we did here is where we created the function, and we looked at our Ebola data oops, in our evaluate window. And then where we looked, well, what happens if I sort? Ah, sort doesn't exist, so apparently I need sort values. What happens if I sort values? Mm, I need a buy. And so I could success successively, in one active session, create my program. And then, ah, sorting now works. If I view it as a data frame, mm -hmm. this looks correct. If I compare to how it's supposed to look. Oh, would you, no, it does show me, no, it doesn't. So, but it looks like the way it's described in the task description, and then I could fill in A, and then I could do all the stuff, and just as much, I can just go over it line by line, and if I now view my, D, my Ebola data, I see, for example, right here, so before this line's executed, ah, most of the NAs are already forward filled, but the rest, so these four at the top are not, so I have to do this forward fill, and so on and so on, and in the end I see, aha, okay, let's return this, Next step, does this actually work? A search frame equal, ah, it doesn't return anything wrong, good. Then I can um, continue with my program and go to my next test function. And this is how I would go through uh, making the homework. Like I said, doing stuff in the debugger way easier, way faster. And yeah, I will show this for a second next week um, and then the next homework next week, but yeah. That's it. I'm actually four minutes over time. God damn it. Okay, but I hope I showed you uh, how useful the debugger is and when to apply it and how to apply it and that it's nothing to be afraid of and that it's so much useful, so much more useful than print statements and that you now use it all the time. Yeah, okay. Um, there are going to be 
a normal and a bonus exercise this week. I didn't make it yet, so I don't know yet what it is, but it will upload it tomorrow and the day after tomorrow, I hope. And yeah, we don't see each other on Thursday. You see Rüdiger next Tuesday. Thank you.